All right, hello everyone. I'm here to talk about 802.11ah, or Wi-Fi Halo, a new IoT technology that's being implemented, but the standard itself has been around for a while. It was amended back in 2016, and in 2017, it was quickly superseded. And now it's rolled into the latest iterations of the 802.11 uh, proper standard uh, that's ratified every, uh, every four years or so. So some of you may have seen this picture before, but physicists look at the world a little differently, right? And teachers like to experiment and try new things. If you really want to master a subject, refine your knowledge of that content so that you can explain it in simple terms to a six-year-old. And you want to get more experience about different technologies, different ways of doing things, and that comes from experimentation or thinking outside the box, right? So there's a lot of talks this week where you hear about Wi-Fi 7 and exciting things that are happening in six gigahertz, but I think we need to move in the opposite direction, right? We've left 900 behind, the 900 megahertz band. We need to revisit that and explore how we can leverage that uh, frequency, that space, in cool projects that we work on. And because we're talking about perspective, right, us as wireless practitioners, when we would look out into a playground, this is what we may see. Waves, propagation of signals, reflections off the children as they spin and swing around, uh, sine waves forming everywhere. Right? It's just a different perspective of things. So my name is Troy Martin. Uh, I come from uh, the land up north. Uh, like many of you, I enjoy wireless things. Uh, and I'm a big fan of cycling. In fact, uh, for the first time at WPC, we had a group ride this morning uh, with Jim and Mark and myself. Uh, we rode about uh, 20 kilometers or so uh, around the Phoenix area. And so we're looking forward to doing that uh, many more mornings this week and uh, for many more years to come at WPC. You can also find me on the, the socials. But I want you to imagine now an IoT scenario, right? A lot of people talk about IoT. Uh, so it's probably not revolutionary for you to think about uh, temperature sensors, pressure sensors, humidity sensors, but I want to start you thinking about them at scale. Imagine attaching stickers onto horses or cows where we can track their health metrics as they roam and walk around various fields, get lost in the bush. Uh, we may want to attach GPS tags to them so we can track and identify them if they don't uh, end up with the herd. Uh, maybe they got hurt or injured and we need to go recover them. All right, so if we can identify where they are in the bushes and the shrubs, it becomes more of a targeted rescue uh, to save that livestock. Another common IoT scenario is warehouse environments. Right? Uh, we promote Wi-Fi, often you hear great things about speed tests and the massive amounts of bandwidth that we talk, and us as a collective community, we laugh at that, and often we respond, who needs that much bandwidth anyway? Well, let's put our money where our mouth is, right? Maybe we don't need that much bandwidth in a warehouse, right? If you consider a 100,000 square foot warehouse, how many traditional Wi-Fi access points do you think you'd need to cover that space? 30, 40? 50 access points? What if you could do it with a single access point? Right? You're worried about redundancy, so throw in two for good measure. Right? Two APs now covers an entire warehouse. Now, a lot of manufacturers may be panicking at this moment because their sales have just dropped, because right? prices are pretty attractive for the Wi-Fi Halo equipment. Right? But also consider some uh, really innovative warehouse designs where the shelving itself is so dense that people can no longer fit between the shelves. Only robots can get in there to pick inventory or replenish inventory within those shelves. And instructions and commands need to be sent to those robots so they know where to pick uh, their next item in that warehouse, right? At that level of density, can you stream five gigahertz, six gigahertz signals into that warehouse environment? Not in that type of situation. And as these warehouses become larger and larger, uh, that precious commodity of, of square footage becomes more valuable. Uh, we also have an example of, I uh, think, ports or large warehouses, right? I happen to come from a, a country where auto theft seems to be a problem. So the ability to monitor uh, uh, ports and containers and maybe identify some products that shouldn't be leaving the country could be important. If the light poles are spread out two or 300 apart, feet apart and they're 100 feet tall, we need a technology that can uh, stream back video content with adequate bandwidth provide the connectivity that we're looking for. 
right? This is a bit of a marketing tank that comes from the Wi-Fi Alliance website, right? So we should get excited about a uh, new technology that's sub one gigahertz that can easily penetrate through walls. Uh, to make JJ happy, it natively supports WPA3, which is the intended way that it should be deployed, right? Uh, it operates on coin cell batteries uh, without the need of proprietary or complex gateways, right? We, we just call them access points, something we're very comfortable and familiar with. Uh, here's another take of a slide from the Wi-Fi Alliance. And you can see we keep focusing on moving things higher and faster as we move up the stack. Right, as we move into the 6 gigahertz band, uh, there's also 60 gigahertz. Uh, we can move mass amounts of data, which is handy for augmented reality, video reality, and those types of situations. But we've left a few um, standards behind. Uh, there's, or there's, in, in the future, we'll have Wi-Fi 7, right, which is, uh, we'll hear more about that this week. Uh, there's a long and forgotten a Wi-Fi 6 R2, right, where they added some enhancements for IoT, but we don't, uh, we don't talk about that one too much. And to put things into context, here's a little chart showing data rate versus range. And we have some high bandwidth applications. We have low bandwidth applications that consume very little amounts of battery. And we have technologies that can travel long distances. We're looking at upwards of 10 kilometers. Halo fits in the middle of that. We get excellent range for excellent uh, throughput. Right? Whereas a lot of these uh, technologies like LoRaWAN, it's easy to hit 10 kilometers, but you're limited to sometimes 50, uh, 50 bits per second of throughput. Right? Not a lot of information you can send there, and certainly not video content. Right? This slide we may be more interested in uh, as, as geeks, right? looking at the content here. I've broken the columns up to try and compare 802.11ac versus Halo, right? with a few notable exceptions in this chart. Right, sub one gigahertz, so in the US, we're concerned about the 915 band, 915 megahertz. Uh, there's other bands that are supported uh, globally in different regulatory domains. Uh, channel width for Wi-Fi Halo, it supports one megahertz, and this is where it becomes interesting. It also supports two, four, eight, and 16. And if you map that with 11AC, which is 20, 40, 80, and 160, the difference is a factor of 10. Wi-Fi Halo is essentially one-tenth of 11AC. Many of the parameters and data rates that we look at, it's derived from the 11AC data rate tables. Other notable exceptions, if you've ever been asked how many devices connect to this Wi-Fi access point, right? As a cheeky answer, you may say 42, but the, the IEEE standard limits it to 2007. Right? And if you thought that wasn't enough access points, 11AH takes it all the way to 8192. Right? Data rates, right? put some numbers around this for Wi-Fi Halo, we're looking at upwards of eight, uh, 86.7 megabits per second. Right? At 500 meters, 1,000 meters, right? some significant differences. Uh, now you can debate the range, these are just kind of contextual numbers for, for distance. We're comparing 100 meters of, of what we're calling now legacy, or I will call legacy Wi-Fi. Uh, against ranges of up to uh, one kilometer. Because the, the subcarriers and the channel width is so narrow, there's significant improvements in the noise floor, right? So upwards of 24 dB uh, improvements as we go to those narrow channel widths. Another interesting data point, if you remember your CWNA and thinking about the channel width of subcarriers with uh, Wi-Fi 5 of 312.5 kilohertz, in Wi-Fi Halo, it's one-tenth of that, right? So we're, we're looking at narrower subchannels or subcarriers, uh, but the symbol time is four times larger. So as we hurl that symbol through the airwaves or lob a football through the airwaves, it's sitting in the air four times longer. Uh, Wi-Fi Halo supports up to eight, or sorry, up to four spatial streams with our typical modulations that we're used to looking at. Right? And the extra emphasis on WPA3. Right. Now, if we start looking at channels, uh, here's a representation of channels that you see in the US, and I have two versions of this slide. Uh, the numbers that you see here come from some of the manufacturers that have tested and how they number the channels, but I would argue that this isn't compliant with the way the standards or regulatory bodies are numbering the channels. And in this particular view, I've grayed out 8 and 16, because specific to this hardware, those lower, or the, the 8 and 16 are not supported. Right, so they're grayed out there. Uh, channel numbers that you may see part of the standard 
or release with new hardware, so you may have an incompatibility in how they reference their channels. Uh, this is more typically of what you'd see in the US, a uh, view like this with these channel numbers here. So just a little comment about that on the bottom. And to make sure that uh, you know, we're looking beyond the US, right? it's not the only country in the world, uh, although we have a massive amount of spectrum here, this is what it looks like in the EU. Right? So Wi-Fi Halo is a fantastic story uh, for certain regions, uh, maybe not as attractive uh, in other regions. Now, if we expand this out even to more regions and look at this uh, spectrum that's available in context, uh, 26 megahertz available in the US, uh, sometimes four, six megahertz available in other regions. Uh, Korea uses a 0.5 because they build in a bit of a guard band, a safety margin, bordering those channels. Uh, and Japan does things a little bit different. They define things based on center channels, not the uh, lower and upper edge of those channels. So that explains uh, some of those differences. Now, I'm sure we all have this picture uh, saved as a desktop background or mounted on our wall, uh, showing a massive chunk of uh, spectrum in our, <laughs> in our world. But really what we're talking about is this little slice of orange in the middle. That's what the 900 megahertz band is in the US. Right? If we look at this in context of access points and stations, right, the one and two megahertz are required by all stations, right? because they'd be supported in all countries. Every country that's jumping on the halo bandwagon or has uh, some spectrum available, they'll support up to four megahertz, but that may be their entire channel width one channel of four megahertz um, coverage. Right? There are options to also support eight and 16 megahertz. Uh, to my knowledge today, there is no hardware available that supports 16 megahertz. Right? It's peaked out at eight megahertz support, uh, and a list of some data rates uh, across the right-hand side, and you can see how that would multiply out as you increase the number of spatial streams. Right? The hardware available today supports one spatial stream, but MIMO, and even multi-user MIMO in the downstream direction is built into the standard itself. I'd also like to give a shout out to Bender uh, through his web hosting strategy, has acquired mcsindex.net, uh, uh, and upon which uh, Francois' data has been aggregated to show the data rates of various Wi-Fi protocols, but I'm happy to announce that we've uh, added a tab for sub one gigahertz, uh, so free to check that out. Uh, for additional data rates there. Now this table shows all the data rates that are available, but as I mentioned, the hardware today is only the top quarter of this chart, right? Just one spatial stream, 16 megahertz isn't supported by available hardware today, so we're looking at an upper range of about 40 megabits for a data rate, okay? So very exciting, uh, check out this, um, this site, okay? Uh, some cool features with Wi-Fi Halo, we talked about the association IDs jumping up to 8192. Uh, and the way they number this is kind of interesting. As they assign those association IDs, they carve out the upper bits into sets of uh, page groups, block groups, and sub-block groups. Okay? And what this allows them to do is we have something called a restricted access window that in between beacons, we can assign a page of devices uh, a slice of talk time. So instead of everyone fighting or contending for the airtime, you only contend for airtime within your restricted uh, access window, right? Uh, and so we have raw parameter sets that are sent and updated on every beacon interval. The, the restricted access windows themselves don't have to be the same size, right? So we can adjust their size and vary them uh, from each beacon. And at the end, we can leave it uh, open to traditional Wi-Fi behavior where everybody's fighting for the right to uh, party or, or to transmit, right? Uh, we also have target wait time that was built into the A uh, 11AH standard, right? Uh, and then they've enhanced and refined it as part of uh, AX, so it's continuing to evolve. But let's start talking about measurements, right? So I think there's lies, damn lies, and speed test, right, is the way I like to, to look at this. Uh, these are some of the results that, that I collected. Um, it wasn't uh, a rigorous setup. Uh, I strapped my Halo access point, uh, zip tied it to a bottle of whiskey. It's a Waterford Irish whiskey, it's fantastic. Um, <laughs> uh, uh, and then I had some uh, alpha uh, cards that I attached to Raspberry Pis. Uh, my setup, I tried just sending uh, traffic from one station to an access point uh, across an open configured connection. I tried it with WPA3, uh, so both of those were using TCP. 
And then I tried it again with UDP, which gives me higher marketing numbers, so I can increase the speeds and feeds and it sounds better on paper. Uh, and then I tried having two stations transmit at the same time. And you can see the results that I have uh, in megabits uh, across various channels. Uh, not the results I was hoping to get, uh, but it ended up being about roughly half the data rate, right? So I had some results there. Uh, here's some packet captures uh, from the data that I was sending. Uh, I was using about, I was averaging about MCS7. Uh, so not the highest that it could go, but it was uh, fairly effective. Uh, now, some people may get this joke or not. Uh, they say there's two types of people in the world, those that understand binary and those that don't. Uh, there's two beacons that Wi-Fi Halo uses, a short beacon which compresses the SSID name uh, and eliminates extra gibberish that you'd find in beacon information to reduce the amount of airtime being consumed. Right? So those go out roughly every 100 time units. Uh, and then there's a, uh, the full Monty beacon that goes out uh, roughly every 1,000 time units, which contains a lot of the information elements and other details. Okay. Um, so here's just a snippet of the beacon, and uh, in this particular capture, I, if you notice the, the time frame, I did lose a few beacons, uh, so they weren't all gained in this capture. I tried to highlight a few interesting points about the beacon. Um, I brought some Halo hardware. I know Mark has some Halo hardware as, as well here, so if you wanted to see us set, uh, set some stuff up or look at some packet captures, uh, we can make that available for you guys to, to look at. Uh, also, WPA3 works exactly like you think it would uh, from your regular Wi-Fi captures, right? So here's just a packet capture of that, emphasizing a few of the, the frames that are exchanged, um, but WPA3 is, is very similar on Halo. Uh, a little bit of the marketing aspect, uh, Morse Micro is who I'd recommend for a hardware manufacturer if you're looking at going down the Halo path. They have recently performed a test. Uh, now this was a line of sight test compared to my tests in the basement through walls or residential areas. Uh, they set up a bunch of virtual flags on a beach and they tested every 500 meters, right? So at 1500 meters, they were able to push eight megs of throughput and sustain a FaceTime video call. At 3000 meters or three kilometers, using an eight megahertz uh, channel for LoRa, and you can see how the, the spectrum was behaving when they were transmitting data or, sorry, that's uh, just the, the, a measure of the quality of the spectrum, not necessarily when they were transmitting, uh, just to see if there was any interfering noise. Uh, at 3,000 meters or three kilometers, they saw one megabit per second. Okay. Uh, here's some other testing that I did, just to give you some perspective. Uh, the purple or the mauve, the fuchsia, uh, whatever you want to call that, uh, using Wi-Fi 6, uh, showing its rough coverage size, versus what I found using two megahertz for Wi-Fi Halo. So significantly larger coverage footprints. Here's a list of what I would describe as the major manufacturers that are out there. Again, Morse Micro is the one that I recommend. Uh, the testing I did was based on using the Neurocom uh, chipsets. Okay. If you look at the Wi-Fi Alliance for certified products, uh, this is all that's there. These are the only Wi-Fi Halo certified products that are there. This is a cool table summarizing a comparison between different IoT technologies. Uh, that we can see. Uh, so big differences in their speeds and feeds and their data rates. And so the two things that I want to leave everybody with, two thoughts. So just coming back to the beginning of my talk, I just want people to, th to know and be aware, I don't make up these rules, I'm just repeating them. Cyclists are better people. Right? And if you want to understand more about that, come talk to me after. It's just the really bad for the economy. Right? For a lot of various reasons. And the last thought I want to leave you guys with is be relentlessly curious. All right, thank you.